I'm, the, I'm just the writer, so I have no bells and whistles, I have no images, I have just words that I wrote, and now I'm going to read them. Um, I'm glad we're gathered here today under the banner of storytelling rather than journalism, because one is not quite the other. One is information, the other communication. How to arrange facts, one, two, three, A, B, C, how to make something clear, how to summarize, how to conclude, organize exposition and analysis. These are the tenets and tropes of print journalism. Cut and paste, edit. When I was in my mid-twenties, I worked for Time magazine. This was in the mid-nineties. I worked for the international edition in London. And the Time magazine at that time was not quite the sort of thin, meager um, offering that it is now. Um, although I do remember several rather lame pop-up science covers, one on dinosaurs, another one on being thin that we did during my time. But the office was still full of old hands who had once jumped out of helicopters with the South Vietnamese army uh, or been a Moscow bureau chief during the Cold War. And Time magazine had a well-honed and trusted style of writing, uh, st writing a story. And this is how I learned to write journalism, time style. I never went to journalism school, so this became my model, my template. It's a structure that many of you will know from either reading it or writing it. It goes, colour intro, nut graph, rest of the story, on the one hand, on the other hand, kicker at the end, boom, shh. You get a clever little knotted up conclusion at the end. So you get the nice scene setting introductory anecdote that pulls you into place and time. And then you cut quite quickly into a description of what the story is and what's going to happen on the, in the story and why you're reading the story. And then you develop the story and at the end you wrap it up in a nice little bow. It's a classic, it's a standard, it's easy to read. And I still use this as my default mechanism when I'm stuck. It also has the great virtue of making editors happy. For some reason, I was not satisfied with this tried and tested method. My original heroes were the writers who wrote non-fiction almost as an extension of autobiography. Hemingway, Tolstoy, Arthur Kostler, Isaac Babel. A more later discovery of mine I think I would also add to the list would be Curzio Malapart, who's really great if you should read him. Um, and they often blurred through the line of reporting into fiction. I wanted to write stories that could be read in 50 years and not be out of date by the end of the week. So I quit Time magazine and I went to live in Tbilisi in Georgia. No one could understand what the hell I thought I was doing and I couldn't quite explain it either. It was 1998, there was only four hours of electricity a day in Tbilisi, no heat, and the post-Soviet ethnic civil wars had finished and there was no news either. That first winter, I sat in bed and tried to write fiction by candlelight. A friendly editor at Time who read these early efforts tried to be kind, but he said they all sounded like Time stories. He said, drop the kicker. <laughs> it took me a year to shake the Time style habit. It took me a year to realize that I couldn't write fiction about a foreign place as a foreigner. That if I wanted to communicate Georgia and all these wonderful tales of people and culture and feasts and that were around me, I had to write about real people as I saw them, which meant first person, which meant narrative. Writing in a place when there were no other journalists or not very many other foreigners either, before internet streaming, even before mobile phones really took off, it was kind of like a perfect isolation tank. I wrote stories about my friends and in incidents and anecdotes and moments, and these stories emerged somewhere between travelogue and reportage, memoir and short story. I collected them into a book, which I called Stories I Stole, which is kind of apt. And it's sort of a mix somehow I've used ever since. I've spent much of the post 9-11 decade, well, it's more than a decade now, in the Middle East. That's where the news was, and even though I kept trying to escape it, I left Iraq, for example, in 2005 and moved to Beirut. And in June, just as I was settling down to write my second book about the Iraqi general, there was a nice, nasty summer war blew up out of a blue sky between 
Israel and Hezbollah. When I'm writing books, when I was writing for Granta, for example, when I was trying to write on the literary end of nonfiction and kind of push against the envelope, I found that I had learned a couple of things from my time in Georgia. One, that there was a difference between fact and truth. When I'm stretching, when I'm really trying to tell a story, to communicate something different or foreign or other, whether it's morality in the upper echelon of the Ba'ath Party or the chaotic welter of the Egyptian Revolution, that the crunchy backstory of complicated history, the particular date of someone's age or income or what they do or where they live, are not as important as the grime around the hem of someone's trousers or a certain nuance in a smile that might seem to suggest fear. These are the details I think are more telling. I try and escape from exposition as much as I can. The context of the story, the news, I sometimes try to treat like the scenery in a play. It's sort of the backdrop. And the foreground is the character, their family, their trials, their dilemmas. The second thing that follows on from this, I think I learned in Georgia originally, was that story comes from character. We think that a story is plot, but actually it's about people and who they are. What happens in the story comes from what they do, and what they do is their reaction to a circumstance, and this comes from their personalities um, and, and, and their lives. In Iraq or in southern Lebanon or in Egypt, I've always tried to show that there are people here, that they are funny and they are complicated and they are curious and they have funny personalities and that it's not just a place in which events and issues happen. I continue to hope and believe that the thing that will really make someone reading a story about a foreign other place, sitting in London or New York or Bucharest, understand or care or feel connected to that place is by the descriptions of people there, is by being able to somehow connect to real people. So these are sort of two of the tent poles that I kind of have in my head when I begin, when I want to tell a story. You will notice that they veer a little bit from journalism into fiction. Storytelling is both, can be both. Storytelling can be whatever you want it to be, I think, as long as it isn't disingenuous, as long as the reader knows where the line is between the actual and really and imagination, or if that line has been blurred. I think it's perfectly acceptable to blur it if it's understood that that's what's happening. So now, you're telling a story. If I'm beginning to tell a story, I have these two ideas, to tell it the best I can, to make it as true as I can, to render character as carefully as I can. I've been telling, talking in generalized terms, so let me give you a specific. This is a case study from my own experience. It is, I think, my favorite, possibly the best story I ever wrote. Let me tell you how I came to write it. I was in Kurdistan in northern Iraq in March 2003, waiting for the American invasion, which did not come our way because Turkey wouldn't let them come over the border from the north. On March the 17th, while the world was biting its nails in the Kuwaiti desert, a small Iraqi story flashed around the news wires briefly. Some hundred-odd Iraqi prisoners of war were being repatriated across the border from Iran. Now, these were soldiers who had been captured during the Iran-Iraq war, which had ended in 1990, and they had been kept hostage all this time, more than a decade beyond the ceasefire. Some of them had even been captured in the early 80s. Apparently, they had been kept in Iran, in prison, incommunicado, without any letters to or from their families, without any news of the outside world for more than 20 years. Imagine, I thought, that you were taken away when Saddam is at the height of power, when Iraq is rich and strong, before the attritive war with Iran killed hundreds of thousands and bankrupted the treasury, before the disastrous invasion of Kuwait and the sanctions that impoverished the country afterwards. Imagine coming home to grown children you had never met, and a family who thought you were dead years ago. Three days later, the Americans crossed the border into Iraq and the story was subsumed into the melee, but it stuck in my head. I bought the original Rip Van Winkle fairy tale, which turns out to be about a man who goes to sleep in colonial America and wakes up 20 years later in a republic. And I bought The Return of Martin Guerre, which I don't know if you know it is a true story, 
um, about a man who comes back to his village in France in the, seven, in the 16th century and takes up with his wife only to be unmasked as an imposter, and there's a famous court case about it. So you could say, in this case, I, had, I knew what my story was before I found my character. It took a bit of time and several false leads, but eventually I found an artillery officer called Thayer al-Samurai, who had been captured in 1982. He had kept his faith in Saddam and the Ba'ath Party all his years in captivity and returned three days before the American invasion. I talked to him for six months, once a week, six months in Baghdad, and I gathered every detail of his life his life before, his prison blankets, his friends, the time near the end of his captivity when the Iranians finally brought them TV and they saw, and all the prisoners saw for the first time, the Soviet Union has collapsed. When I came to write the story, I wanted to start it, at, I started it at the beginning. Thyra is a young man, clever at school, joining the Ba'ath Party, hoping for a glorious future, his enrollment in officer school, fighting in the desert, his capture, his loyalty to his country, and why he'd clung to it, coming home, or the disillusion and dislocation. I wanted to write a very straightforward and then and then narrative. I wanted the reader to not know what was going to happen to Thayer. I wanted the years to pile up longer and longer so the reader would be thinking, God, is he still in prison? Is he ever going to get out? I wanted the reader to begin the story not knowing how it would end. I wrote the story for Granta, but the editor, who I have to say is one of my favorite editors ever, insisted I put in an introduction about me searching for these prisoners of war. And this, of course, was a spoiler, and it gave the game away, and it told the reader what they were reading before they read it. It seems hard, even for literary forums, to push narrative nonfiction into different shapes. And I wish convention sometimes did not have such a stronghold. But it is very hard for the writer too. It's hard to wander from the path of intro and nut graph because you're in the wilderness. What comes first? How to tell? I keep in mind, yes, truth, character. But like, what's my first sentence? How much backstory? How much context or explanation? And then I hit Somerset Maugham's famous quote, there are only three rules to writing a novel and nobody knows what they are. <laughs> there is no reason narrative nonfiction cannot borrow devices from fiction. And so let me amend. There are only three rules to writing a story, but nobody knows what they are. Quotes can be rendered as interior monologues. Events can be mixed up out of order. Suspense can be created. And just as there are whole novels made out of only dialogue, why can't narrative fic nonfiction why can't a narrative non-fiction story be fashioned from a single conversation? Just as there are whole novels without any dialogue in them, why can't a non-fiction narrative be written without any quotes? Hmm. I am thinking, this is all very interesting. I have not yet figured it out. I come to my third tentpole idea, tenant. When in doubt, default honesty. This is why I like the first person. In narrative nonfiction, especially when writing about unfamiliar places, the writer can be the reader's guide. I went, I saw, it was hot, it was cold, it felt weird. It makes a bridge between one place and the other, and I think that's why I like to use it. It fosters intimacy with the reader. Let me take you by the hand, let me show you this, let me show you that. And in this way, whenever I get stuck or confused or entangled or don't quite know the way to the next paragraph, I take a step back and reveal. I was confused. I didn't know what to make of this guy. I was frightened or I was worried. And I think it's perfectly acceptable to say sometimes, and I think journalists should do it more often, I didn't understand why. So it's a little trick. Try it next time, default honesty. Just tell the reader what your problem is, and very often by describing your problem, you've written your way out of it. But it doesn't help at all with the problem that no storyteller can ever come clean about. I have been talking about how to tell a story, but there is a much more scary unknown. What the hell is a story? I like to tell the story of Thayer al-Samurai because it's the only story I have written that I, when I knew what it was and I went to find it and I found it and I wrote it. Sometimes, if you are lucky, a story will fall into your lap. This happens extremely infrequently. In my case, I think about once every five years. <clears throat> 
for example, once a friend of mine in Tbilisi was sheltering a friend of hers in her flat who was recovering from a bullet wound he had received in a duel. I mean, this was easy. This was like the divine intervention of Pushkin. In Cairo, a friend of mine once told me that she and her family had been dispossessed of their apartment under cover of the revolution by her evil twin aunts. This is, again, like this brilliant story of family intrigue and hired thugs and a policeman who had a post-revolutionary conscience who refused a bribe and executed a court order and got them all back in their home. In Baghdad once, I remember my translator told me about a friend of a friend of a friend of his <coughs> who was blowing up Americans at night as part of a resistance cell while his brother was selling the Americans' porno pirate DVDs outside their base. But to be honest, these gifts are rare. Why do you think magazines are full of famous people? <laughs> Editors have a fallback too. Default profile. I spent two months in Damascus in 2005. There were a lot of Iraqi refugees. There was a small demonstration against the Assad regime. I went to a monastery in the desert who was run by this rather extraordinary Jesuit monk who was dedicated to dialogue between Christianity and Islam. I interviewed dissidents and sheikhs, and I went to nightclubs where they were selling 13-year-old girl, Iraqi girls to Saudis <laughs> drinking whiskey. I couldn't find any way to f knit these things into a story. I tried to make sort of three stories into a triptych. I tried to sort of weave certain things. My editor at Granta, I remember making a bleating noise, like, no. I came out of a year and a half in Cairo with several New Yorker articles about issues that I had been commissioned. The army, women, Islamists, but no real story story. And I was starting to write a book about the revolution. I remember feeling this kind of terror panic about not having a story story. And then I took a step back and I realized that maybe the incoherent narrative was the story. The story was in the confusion, in the welter, in the mayhem that nobody had been able to quite understand at the time. You see, this is default honesty in action. And now here I am in Bucharest. I want to stay for a couple of weeks and find a good story. As Lavinia was saying, I have only been here for two days, and the last time I was here, it was 1990. And in fact, I was dark and full of rubbish fires, and there was very little food. People would do anything for a pack of cigarettes. I think we bribed our way into Ceausescu's palace like this. It was still unfinished, and we were hiding from the patrolling guards. And I kept a diary every day of this sort of three-month odyssey around the Balkans, actually, that Romania was part of. But I did not have any idea how to make stories of these experiences. Now, after two days, what should I do? How should I proceed? Should I take my starting point, these old memories of a Romania that doesn't exist anymore, and update them and fill in 25 years of history? Should I look for the biggest story in Romania now? Is it Roma or emigration or the former intelligence chief running for president? Do I fall back on the obvious, vampires and Transylvania? Should I try and do what I've been thinking about for some time now, which is to write about food in a way that's narrative and does, does something nobody can, I can't quite explain to anyone? You see that a story is a fluttery sort of butterfly to catch. Narrative nonfiction is as much about imagination as it is about reporting. What do we make of this world? What do we see? What do we notice? What do we tell? How do we tell it? It is mysterious. It is a very great challenge. And when you have a lead or an inkling, it is the most exciting thing in the world. And when you are flailing about with bits of scenes and oddball characters that don't fit into them, it is sheer agony. And now I am standing on the edge again in a new country with new roads to travel and people to meet. And this is, in many ways, the most wonderful feeling in the world, but also terrifying. So if any of you have any good ideas for stories, please see me after. Thank you.